So hello everyone and welcome to our fourth Inspiration Exchange session and our final session of 2020. Uh, my name is Nick Maxfield. I handle the Van der Schaar Labs communications and I'll be moderating today's session. I uh, will also be joined by Mihaila van der Schaar, who will be providing support and a brief introduction at the start. And a number of members of our own lab um, who will be talking about their recent research projects and giving presentations and handling a Q&A. So to give you an idea of what to expect from today's session, um, we'll actually be taking a break from our AutoML theme from previous sessions, and we'll be aiming to introduce some of our lab's latest exciting projects around machine learning for healthcare. Um, we will have the researchers behind these projects available on hand for a Q&A and discussion. And what we'd really like to do in this session is to try and give a sense of the breadth of different topics in ML for healthcare, and hopefully generate some ideas for future research. Uh, so to give you an idea of how this session is going to break down, um, we're going to have a quick intro from me and a few words from Mihaila, after which we'll go into a series of mini presentations. We have nine of these, and they're about three minutes each on our new research project. And following this, uh, the remainder of the time will be spent in a Q&A and discussion on these research projects. Again, we do have our um, lab members available to discuss these with you. Uh, we would like to ask you to post your questions on the projects as they're um, being discussed in the presentations. And uh, please try to post them early into our Slack chat in the Inspiration Exchange channel. And we're allocating about a minute per question and two minutes per question and answer. And just before five, we'll go into some closing words and a wrap up from me. Anyway, um, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Mihaila briefly for a few opening words. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for making the time to uh, visit us again in this Inspiration Exchange today. When I started uh, together with, our, with Nick and our lab, uh, this endeavor in September, I was mentioning the fact that I realized after I give the ICML 2020 tutorial on machine learning for healthcare, that everyone uh, around me had a need to kind of meet and discuss ideas in machine learning for healthcare in a forum because we couldn't meet each other at conferences. Also, as COVID continued and um, we cannot meet each other at key conferences, I remember the excitement my students have had in presenting their work last year at Neurips uh, 2019 and how excited they were to, to meet others like you and discuss. Um, I realized that, that these opportunities unfortunately are not there for some time. So that's why I'm so excited today that even though next week we are not going to be all meeting each other at conferences such as Neurips, um, we have these forums hopefully to meet and discuss and brainstorm and hopefully find collaborators. I also need to say that it is due to these discussions last year that I recruited one of the members of our own lab, Yerun. So it is meeting him at last year, Neurips 2019, that has led to us recruiting him and, and many collaborations since then. So because that's not possible, I'm really thankful to you all for engaging with us today. And what we decided to do is to present to you the, the briefly the nine papers we are going to present next week at Neurips 2020 and give you a preview of these different works and ask you to engage with us and especially with my students to, to ask questions that hopefully will inspire us and lead to future discussion. Okay, thanks, Mihaila. Um, we actually have a question I'd like to address uh, kind of right off the bat, which is um, where is the Slack channel to ask questions? Um, if you do have a previous email from me um, about Inspiration Exchange, you can follow the link to the Slack workspace there. Um, so, Anyway, to move on with the uh, session, uh, it's now time to get started with the presentations from our lab members. As I mentioned before, there are nine of these and we'll be, um, we have about three minutes for each. They're pre-recorded because we didn't want to risk any kind of technical or logistical issues. Uh, please do post your questions into the Inspiration Exchange Slack channel. Um, and please try to post these early if at all possible, because uh, it increases the likelihood that we'll be able to get to your question. And also it definitely helps us out a lot as um, organizers as well. Um, okay, so our first presentation is by Jonathan Crabbe. Um, Jonathan is a PhD student who joined our lab earlier this year, and it's on Symbolic Pursuit. 
Hello everybody, my name is Jonathan Crabé. I'm a PhD student at the Van der Lab, and today I'm very happy to share with you my research project, which is called Learning Outside the Black Box, the Pursuit of Interpretable Models. So first of all, I would like to thank my collaborators for this project, which are Yao Zhang, William Zeim, and Mihaela Van der So let us delve directly in the problem we are addressing inside this project. We notice that in many fields, and especially in healthcare, Trusts on machine learning models heavily relies on their transparency. And the problem is that most of the state-of-the-art machine learning models correspond to very complicated mathematical expression. To see this, let us take a very simple example. Consider this baby MLP. Very simple. Two input features, two hidden layers. And yet, if you translate this into a mathematical expression, you obtain something like this. And well, as you can notice, it contains a lot of nested functions and also it is a very long expression. So we can easily agree on the fact that these expressions are not interpretable or not transparent at all. So how do you deal with this in practice? Well, what most interpretability methods do is that they treat this complicated black box model F for an estimation, which is a simplification and a transparent model F hat. So how do you simplify the black box? Well, probably the most common approach is to focus only on the local behavior of F. So for instance, you only care about what's happening at the vicinity of a point inside input space for the black box F. Well, if this more method works very well in practice, it comes with a lot of new limitations. For instance, you might lose very valuable information about dealing only with local behavior. To see this, consider this very simple example. Consider this pseudo black box F which is an exponential in this case. Now suppose that you approximate this exponential at the vicinity of x equals zero. So we can come with this kind of polynomials. And while this polynomial is a good approximation of the exponential at the vicinity of x equals zero, it completely misses the exponential behavior. So you can see here that by only caring about local behaviors, you might lose valuable information. In this case, the fact that you are dealing with an exponential. So this leads us to a natural question. Is it possible to translate this kind of black box F into expressions that are explicit, global, and yet tractable by human beings? To answer this question, we introduce symbolic models. And these models rely on two ideas. The first one is projection pursuit, which is a strategy that we use to build parsimonious models. The idea is that you increase the size of the mathematical expression gradually until you achieve the desired precision. This is a very good illustration of Occam razor principle. The second idea is my OG, are my OG functions. And these are a family of functions that we use because they capture a large class of expressions globally. So you have a dictionary between the familiar mathematical expressions and the my OG functions. And we use these my functions as building blocks of our symbolic models. So now the question is, do these symbolic models work well in practice? The answer to this question is yes. As you can see here, for different kinds of black boxes and for different kinds of data sets, symbolic models achieve very good approximations of the black boxes. And these approximations are good and also they are parsimonious. As you can see here, they, they contain very few terms which correspond to very short expressions. So of course, there is much more to say. And there are a lot of interesting properties that come with this symbolic, symbolic pursuit algorithm and symbolic models. But if you are interested in this, I invite you to read the paper, which is available on the lab's website. Now, I will be very happy to answer these questions if you have some. And in any case, I thank you for your attention. Okay, so uh, next up, we have a presentation from Zhao Ji Chen on uh, compartmental Gaussian processes. Hello, welcome to the presentation of when and how to lift the lockdown, global COVID-19 scenario analysis and policy assessment using compartmental Gaussian processes. I'm the presenter Zhao Zhi. In the COVID-19 global pandemic, the governments around the globe have implemented various kinds of policies to contain the viral outbreak, which includes travel restrictions, school closure, universal masking, and so on. 
Assessing and understanding the effect of these policies is a central question, not only to the policymakers and the research community, but also to everyone whose life has been affected. We are trying to understand what type of policy is most effective for a given country, how strict does it need to be, when should it start, and how long should it last? To answer these questions, we develop compartmental Gaussian process, a Bayesian model that learns heterogeneous policy effects using global data from different countries. Contrary to the conventional methods that are only able to produce a single forecast, our method can predict COVID-19 fatalities under different policy scenarios in a global context. The compartmental Gaussian process, or CGP, is a two-layer hierarchical semi-mechanistic Gaussian process. CGP treats all affected countries jointly rather than modeling them separately as the conventional methods do. The upper layer exploits variations of policies across countries as well as their metadata to learn country-specific policy effects. As a result, the policy effect prediction for any given country is informed by data from similar countries. Such information sharing enables accurate and robust predictions even for countries at the early stage of the pandemic where the data are scarce. We use country metadata, including 35 social, economic, demographic, and public health indicators. The policy data contains 13 types of policies, reflecting both their timing and strictness. The lower layer of the CGP is a Gaussian process, with, which uses a mechanistic epidemiology model, known as SEIR model, as its prior mean function. The parameter of the SEIR model are given by the upper layer. Therefore, CGP combines the solid mechanistic foundations of SEIR models as an informative prior with the flexible data-driven modeling of Gaussian processes. Moreover, CGP also enjoys additional advantages such as Bayesian uncertainty quantification and end-to-end gradient-based training. If you are interested in knowing more details of our modeling approach, including formalism and assumptions, or our analysis findings, Please check out our oral presentation and the paper. We also have built an online interactive demonstrator. Thank you. Okay, and our third presentation is from Yarun, um, who is one of our PhD students who joined our lab this year, as Mihaela mentioned a minute ago, and it's on Organite. Hi, my name is Hirun and I'm here to present Organite, an optimal transplant donor organ offering system using the individual treatment effect. So what are we trying to do? Well, given a waiting list of patients in need of an organ, we want to assign the available organ at one timestamp to a patient in the list. This is a very hard problem for several reasons. The first, organs are unique and of high dimensions. Choosing a patient also means not choosing other patients. Some patients are sicker than others, and organ allocation has a long-term effect on the waiting list and not just a recipient. How does Organite do this? How do we make this decision? We do this through balancing three different components. The first component is match with respect to patient organ covariates, which uh, basically means if the available organ matches to the optimal organ for one patient in terms of their covariates, then we say this is a good match. The second component is net life years gained, which is how much time would the person have lived with the organ versus how much time would they have lived without the organ. And a third is a rarity of the available organ expressed as a probability. If the patient is in need of a rare organ, they would receive priority over the other patients in the waiting list. And this is probably the key point of the paper. Sometimes it might be smart to grant an organ to a less suitable patient as their perfect organ is rare. So how does Organite do this? We do this with two different functions. A first function, lambda, um, balances two different components, being the distance and the rarity of the organ. The distance could be Euclidean, is the distance between the available organ and the patient's optimal organ um, expressed through their ITE, which if the distance is very small, so a very good match, then the component in um, this weighting function, lambda, is blown up through the negative exponent. Similarly, for the probability, if the probability of the patient's optimal organ is very low, then this component blows up uh, lambda through the, the negative exponent. 
we then use Lambda to weight the ITE in the second function. So the second function tries to find um, a, a patient in the waiting list by maximizing um, the ITE weighted down by Lambda, where ITE is expressed um, as how much time would the person have lived in the waiting list without the organ versus with the organ. We have some results on synthetic and real data where Organite compares favorably to other assignment policies. For example, sickest person first in the second column is used in the US and incremental survival in the fourth column is used in the UK. Thank you very much for listening to my talk. Uh, please have a look at our paper at NeurIPS um, and I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, so our next presentation is from Jin Sung Yum and, and it's on Vime. Um, I should probably note that uh, Jin Sung is one of our recent alumni and he's now with Google Cloud AI. Um, also, we do have a couple questions now on uh, Jonathan's paper, which is great. But if you do have any questions on the other papers, please feel free to post. Hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about our newest paper, Vime extending the success of self and semi-supervised learning to tabular data. I'm Jin Sung Yoon from Google Cloud AI, and this work is jointly done with my colleague Yao Zhang, James Children, and Professor Mihaila Bandersar when I was in Bandersar lab. As you know, label data is limited and expensive. On the other hand, unlabeled data is easy to acquire and cheap. Therefore, utilizing those unlabeled data is critical. Self and semi supervised learning are popular for utilizing those unlabeled data. So why do we need special self and semi supervised learning for tabular data? Because tabular data is special. Unlike image and language domains, which has explicit spatial and sequential correlation, Tabular data does not have explicit correlation. Therefore, the state-of-the-art self and semi-supervised model are not the optimal for tabular data. This is because those models are heavily relied on specialized pretext tests for self-supervised learning, such as jigsaw puzzle. Also, specialized data augmentation methods are necessary for semi-supervised learning, such as rotation. In this paper, we propose novel pretext test and data augmentation method that are specialized to tabular data. For self supervised learning, we propose a novel mask vector estimation test that predicts which components are corrupted. For semi supervised learning, we propose a novel data augmentation method which is combined with trained encoder to construct more accurate predictors. It can utilize both labeled and unlabeled data. The data architecture of BIME is as follows. Here, mass vector estimator and pretext generator are the novel part of BIME. We have two key lizards, one with genomic data, and the other one is public tabular data. Genome-wide polygenic scoring is one of the most important problems in genomics, and with the proposed BIME framework, it achieved state-of-the-art performance only with a half of the label data. For, for paper reproducibility and generalizability, we also evaluate BIME on public data. And as can be seen in this table, BIME achieved consistently better performance on various tabular data sets. And note that both novel ideas of BIME contribute on performance improvement. Thank you for your attention. If you have any question, please ask to my co-author. And if you want to know more about our research, please visit our website, which includes the code base of this paper. Thank you. Okay, and the next presentation we have is from Trent Kiono, and it's on Castle. Uh, 
Hi, my name is Trent Kyono. Along with my collaborators Yao Zhang and Mihaela van der Schaar, we will be presenting our work on castle regularization via auxiliary causal graph discovery. Regularization controls model complexity and mitigates overfitting with the goal of improved generalization performance on out-of-sample data. We're all familiar with regularization and the many available methods to choose from. However, these methods have limitations. They are agnostic of the causal relationships between variables. Exploiting such causal knowledge can help with identifying optimal predictors based on graphical topology, such as the causal parents of the target variable. Second, causal structure can improve learning of the target variable by learning representations for reconstructing sibling variables. Lastly, by learning causal structure, we can optimally learn to ignore variables that are neighborless in the discovered causal DAG since these variables have no influence on the overall system, let alone the target variable. Causal discovery traditionally requires searching through a combinatorial space to either maximize a DAG score or solve a constraint satisfaction problem. Recent works have successfully accelerated these methods by formulating the causal discovery problem as a continuous optimization over real matrices. For the first time, we present a method that simultaneously discovers the causal graph while exploiting this structure to improve predictive generalization. We call our regularization method CASEL, which stands for Causal Structure Learning. CASEL regularization uses causal graph discovery as an auxiliary task when training a supervised model to improve the generalization performance of the primary prediction task. CASEL learns the causal DAG as an adjacency matrix embedded in a feed-forward neural network's input layers we train D plus one subnetworks with shared hidden layers such that each feature is reconstructed from every other feature. In doing so, CASEL learns to identify optimal predictors for each variable, such as the causal parents. Furthermore, CASEL improves upon autoencoder-based regularization by learning to reconstruct only the input features that have adjacent nodes in the discovered causal graph. In our work, we provide a theoretical generalization bound stating that when a DAG structure exists in the underlying data generating process, CASEL improves generalization performance. Using synthetic data, we show that CASEL improves over a variety of regularization methods. We show this consistent performance for various DAG sizes, data set sizes, as well as added noise variables. Lastly, on real data, we show the generalization power of CASEL, which improves over all benchmark methods across a variety of publicly available UCI datasets. We would like to point out that CASEL consistently ranks highest and demonstrates stability that is not shown with other benchmarks that fluctuate in rank across each dataset. Thank you for your time. Okay. Um... Just a quick note, I think a couple of you are still uh, DMing me asking for the link to the uh, Slack workspace. Uh, that's now been posted into the chat by a good Samaritan. Uh, so please follow that URL if you want to ask any questions. Um, our next presentation is on Saigon and it's from Joanna Bika. Hi everyone, my name is Jana Pika and I will present our work on estimating the effects of continuous valid interventions using generative adversarial networks. This work has been done together with James Jordan and Michaela van der Scher and was accepted for publication in Europe 2020. So in many scenarios such as healthcare, deciding how to intervene involves not only deciding between different treatments, such as chemotherapy or radiotherapy, but also deciding on the value of some continuous parameter associated with the intervention, such as the dosage of the treatment. So in this work, we introduced SIGAN, which is a causal inference method that can be used to estimate the effects of such continuous valid interventions. Our aim is to learn from observational data, such as electronic health records, which contain information about patient features, the type of treatment and the corresponding dosage assigned to them, and the observed outcome. And for each patient, SIGAN can be used to estimate the individualized dose response curve for each type of treatment, which can then be used to inform clinical decision making and select both the optimal treatment and dosage for each patient. Now, compared to binary causal inference setting, which has been tackled by many works so far, in the continuous treatment setting, there are infinitely many counterfactuals, and we have to handle both the treatment and the dosage selection bias present in observational data sets. SIGAN builds on the framework of generative adversarial networks to learn the distribution of the unobserved counterfactuals. So as illustrated here, the generator estimates the individualized dose response curves. And then we define a discriminator that acts on a finite set of points from each generated curve and identifies a factual outcome from the set of factual outcomes and the generated counterfactual ones. 
The intuition is that if a counterfactual generator and discriminator are trained adversarially, then the generator can only fool the discriminator such that it will not be able to correctly identify the factual outcome by generating the potential outcomes according to their true distribution. We'll now go into details of the different components of the model. So the counterfactual generator takes as input the feature, the factual outcome, the received treatment, dosage, and some noise, and outputs the dose response curve for each treatment. We then define a discriminator that will attempt to pick out the factual treatment dosage pair from among the random set of generated ones. And to handle the complexity arising from multiple treatments, we propose a hierarchical discriminator consisting of a treatment discriminator, which needs to identify the factual treatment, and a dosage discriminator, which needs to identify the factual dosage. Now, the second generator and discriminator are trained uh, using the adversarial gain described here, for which we prove that the optimal generator needs to learn counterfactuals according to their true distribution. So in terms of the model architectures, we use a multitask neural network for the generator. And to ensure that the discriminators can act as functions on sets, we build them as permutation invariant and permutation equivariant networks. Finally, for the experiments, we propose a new semi-synthetic data generation process for continuous interventions, and we evaluate the benchmark models on three different data sets. We also perform additional ablation studies and test the robustness of the methods to increase treatment and dosage selection bias. Thank you for listening. Okay, so I think we're about two thirds of the way through the presentations. Um, the next one up is Yao Zhang with Gradient Regularized V Learning. Hi, my name is Yao. I will present our work Gradient Regularized V Learning for Dynamic Treatment Regime. A dynamic treatment regime is a sequence of decision rules that determines which treatments to provide to the patients at each time step. It is similar to the policy in off policy evaluation. But in the DTR settings, we often assume the environment is not Markov because the histories can influence the outcomes and treatment assignment in the future. The main application of DTR is treatment recommendation. For example, at time t, we try to learn the optimum decision rule of assigning radiotherapies or chemotherapy to lung cancer patients for controlling their tumor volumes over time. The decision rule is optimized by maximizing its value function which is the accumulated rewards after time t. A well-optimized decision rule will select chemotherapy for the patient because it gives the largest decrease of tumor volumes in the future. There are other applications of DTR, such as recommender system for customers and decide and launch social policies over a country. The first challenge of DTR evaluations is that we cannot collect new data by running new simulation. Even if the data sets we collected is large. For example, in the case of recommender system, the reward signal in the data set may be very weak and only realized after a long period of time. In this case, we need to deal with the uncertainty in value function estimation. To estimate a value function, we need to in introduce nuisance models to estimate the outcomes and treatment assignment mechanisms over time. After these nuisance models are trained, they are applied to derive an estimator of the value function. If these models overfit to the data, they may damage the performance of the estimator. Formally, in semi-parametric theory, we can derive the full means expansion of the estimator in which the first order bias of the estimator is characterized by the sample average efficient inference curve dt star. A rule n consistent estimator of the value function can be derived by solving the estimated equation, which, is, which sets the sample average dt star to zero. In the literature, doubly robust estimators or one-step estimator can solve the estimating equation based on the, based on the trained nuisance models. However, the nuisance models can still create bias for the estimators in the remainder term of the expansion if they overfit to the training data. In our papers, we propose a different strategy to solve the estimating equation. We do that by parametrizing the nuisance model by a neural network and regularizing it to solve the equation in the training time. Our work is inspired by the target regularization method for the problem of average treatment effect estimation in the static settings. In DTI evaluations, the estimating equations is more complex 
and difficult to solve because it involves Nielsen's models across different time steps. In our papers, we propose a new regularizer to address this challenge. In experiments, our methods outperforms various specialized methods in several simulation studies, which includes applications such as dealing with treatment cost trade-off in treatment recommendation and maximizing survival outcomes for patients. Thank you for watching. If you're interested, take a look at our papers and softwares on our website. Okay, um, just another quick note from me. Um, I've noticed a couple of people posting their questions into the general channel, uh, channel in Slack. Um, if possible, please post them into Inspiration Exchange because general is kind of for announcements and yeah, more general conversations. Um, so it would help if you put them in Inspiration Exchange. Anyway, our penultimate presentation is from Hyun Suk, um, who's another of our alumni. Um, he's now with Sejong University. Um, and it's on robust recursive partitioning. Hi, I am delighted to present our project Robust Recursive Partitioning for Heterogeneous Treatment Effects with Uncertainty Quantification. We develop a heterogeneous treatment effect analysis method to find subgroups that consist of subjects who have similar covariates and treatment responses. The identification of subgroups is important because it improves the interpretation of treatment effects, which makes it possible to develop more effective treatments and to improve the design of further experiments in very wide areas from clinical trials to public policy. In the previous HTE analysis methods, subgroups are identified by maximizing the heterogeneity across subgroups, while ignoring the homogeneity within subgroups. They rely on a specific individualized treatment effect estimator, decision tree. Suppose the true treatment effect is generated by a Gaussian distribution with zero mean and 0.1 standard deviation. Clearly, there are no subgroups. As shown in the figure, the previous methods may find some subgroups if there are groups that have different sample means due to sampling error. To improve the robustness of subgroup analysis methods, we try to quantify uncertainty in the discovery process using confidence intervals of the ITE. We start by constructing an ITE estimator for the entire covariate space. Here we can use any kind of ITE estimator. Then we measure the homogeneity within a subgroup by the concentration of the ITE within the subgroup. Specifically, we obtain the confidence intervals of the ITE estimator by using a conformal prediction method. The confidence intervals constructed by conformal prediction satisfy the frequentist coverage guarantee in finite samples. Now we develop a confident criterion for partitioning the covariate space into subgroups recursively. In the criterion, we minimize the absolute deviation of the ITE confidence interval, SX. We also minimize the expected confidence interval width, WX, because a narrower confidence interval can also help to reduce the deviation. As shown in the figure, the criterion splits the covariate space X into two subgroups. The criterion improves both homogeneity within subgroups and heterogeneity across subgroups. After splitting, we reconstruct the confidence intervals using the samples within each subgroup. Then the confidence intervals satisfy the coverage guarantee within each subgroup. The theoretical guarantee of the confidence intervals in our method can help to avoid false discoveries of subgroups. If the confidence intervals exhibit large overlap across the constructed subgroups, the constructed subgroups are not well identified. Conversely, if the confidence intervals have little or no overlap across subgroups, the subgroups are well identified. Finally, we evaluate our R2P method by comparing its performance with state-of-the-art heterogeneous treatment effect estimation methods. For this, we mainly use the variances across and within subgroups to evaluate the heterogeneity and homogeneity respectively. From the table, we can see that our method R2P achieves the best performance in all the performance metrics while discovering subgroups with minimum overlap to avoid false discoveries as shown in the figure. Thank you for watching. Hi. All right, and our final presentation is from Joanna Bika, and it is on EDM. Hello, my name is Joanna Bika, and I will present our paper on strictly batch imitation learning via energy-based distribution matching. This work has been done in collaboration with Dan Jarrett and Mihala van der Schaar, and it was accepted for publication in Europe's 2020. Mutation learning involves training a policy that can mimic the actions of an expert from which we have access to a data set with demonstrations. 
We consider a strictly bad setting, which arises in many real world scenarios where active experimentation is impossible, such as healthcare. Here, we need to be able to learn an imitation policy with no access to reinforcement signals, no knowledge of transition dynamics, and very importantly, with no further interaction with the environment. We formalize the problem of strictly batch imitation learning and argue that a good solution should satisfy the following desiderata. It should directly learn a policy capturing the stepwise action conditionals without relying on intermediate rewards and without generic constraints biasing the solution. Moreover, it should be dynamics aware by accounting for distribution information and also operate strictly offline, meaning that it should be directly optimizable and not relying on off policy policy evaluation. Now, classic inverse reinforcement learning based algorithms learn an imitator policy indirectly by parameterizing the reward function and repeatedly executing reinforcement learning. Conversely, adversarial imitation learning seek a distribution matching objective and alternate between optimizing a policy and a discriminator-like function. Both of these approaches can only be used in the online setting as they require access to an environment. For strictly batch imitation learning, one solution is to use off-policy policy evaluation as a workaround for these intrinsically online apprenticeship methods, which may introduce more variance than desired, especially when the number of demonstrations are few. So we propose instead a simpler but effective offline method by jointly learning a policy function with an energy-based model of the state distribution. So we are interested in explicitly learning a policy parameterized by theta with occupancy measure rho theta that minimizes the forward KL divergence with the occupancy measure rho d of the demonstrated policy. To achieve this, the ideal loss function and its corresponding gradient are described here. However, backpropagating to the first term here is impossible as we cannot compute rho theta and we also do not have access to online rollouts of pi theta to explicitly estimate it. So to sidestep this problem, we take advantage of the energy, joint energy-based modeling approach introduced by Grothol et al. And we propose approximating rho theta with an energy-based model with the energy function described here. Our proposed energy-based distribution matching technique involves learning a representation of the discriminative policy and the generative occupancy distribution by sharing the same function approximator and thus enforcing a parameter constraint between pi theta and rho theta. This gives us a surrogate objective for the ideal loss function, which can be optimized in the batch setting as sampling from rho theta can be achieved by sampling from the energy-based model. We evaluate EDM against four benchmarks and we show performance gains on both gym environments and on our healthcare data set extracting from the MIMIS3 database. Thank you for listening. Okay, so now it's time to move on to the uh, Q&A part of the session. Um, so the, the rules are kind of the same as always. Um, please post your questions into the Slack chat in the Inspiration Exchange channel. Thankfully, we have about 10 questions already lined up, which is fantastic. Um, we'll ask you to unmute yourself if we choose your question. Uh, please introduce yourself and specify which presentation you're asking about. And we really would like to try and keep you to one minute, if at all possible. Um, and try and kind of handle each question and answer in two minutes total. Um, another reminder, please remute yourself once you've asked your question so that we don't continue to hear you uh, throughout the session. Um, so I believe our first question in our list is from uh, William Sue, and it is for Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan. Uh, great talk. Um, this is William Shu from UCLA. Um, I just wanted to ask you regarding um, your approach with the symbolic models. I'm very curious from a sort of a user standpoint, how someone would interact with the symbolic model to understand or do, you know, interpretation of the more complex model, um, given that, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, is it going to be similar to like the other simpler approaches like Lime and Shape, or is it going to be uh, a little different? So, uh, hello, uh, William, this is a very good question, actually. Um, so, from the user's point of view, we can do actually what Lime and Shape are doing, and actually uh, even um, um, maybe a bit more because you have this mathematical expression that describe what the model is doing. You can like simplify this mathematical expression at the vicinity of an input point inside the input space, and this will give you, for instance, feature importance, but also at higher order, so you can 
because uh, MARG functions are smooth, you can re really differentiate a lot and have higher order effects and actually have feature importance and interactions. So that works very well. Another thing is that you can really simplify the model because you learn uh, in, in the symbolic pursuit algorithm, you actually learn some projection vectors which give you a fine combination of the features. And this is very useful because uh, this is a global uh, behavior of the model. I cannot really elaborate here, but uh, you can have also global insights of how the model behave uh, from the user perspective. Great, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so let's see, our next question is from Max Chen and it is for uh, Jaoji and Ahmed. Please go ahead, Max. Uh, hi, Jaoji. Uh, it was a great presentation. Uh, uh, I'm a master's student from Oxford. Uh, just wondering, uh, well, if the model is robust for the second wave of the pandemic, because uh, it seems that uh, I, I'm imagining if you're using uh, if you are basing off your uh, fertility data before the second wave of the uh, of the pandemic, then it seems that the model may wind up with a unimodal uh, shape. And well, uh, yeah, I'm just curious. So, uh, or if your model is robust against the dynamic of the data, because I'm imagining maybe there's a third wave or or the fourth wave, could you please uh, point out the mechanism of the model that actually can make uh, that, that can uh, make it have such robustness against the future waves. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Max, very good question. Um, I think, I think more, more generally, you're asking about how does the model extrapolate into the future? For instance, uh, if the model has seen only the same data from the second wave, how is it going to make inference about the second wave? Uh, and if the model only has uh, seeing the data on the in the early stage of the pandemic, where all the infection numbers are going up, how can the model uh, try to forecast the uh, a, a downward trend at a later stage of the pandemic? So uh, the mechanism in the model that enables us to forecast second peak and forecast in the dynamic change uh, in the pandemic trend is the uh, epidemiology model. Uh, so it's, it's described by a set of differential equation which is driven by this time varying reproduction number R0. And uh, um, if the R0 goes, beyond, uh, goes below uh, one, uh, actually the uh, epidemiology model will try to will, will predict uh, a decrease in infection number and mortality. And since we're using this epidemiology model as a prior, uh, it will give us some um, belief on the future trend, even if it's not directly observed in the data. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Very inspiring. Thank you. Thanks very much, both. Okay, so um, looks like our next question is from Jeremy for Yeroen. Hi. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, from the talks. It's uh, Jeremy Voisey from Canon Medical Edinburgh. So, a very simple question. I just like to be uh, know the details on the model used to estimate the individualized treatment effects for the transplant versus the waiting list. Hi, Jeremy. Yeah, so that's actually a very good question. Um, we, I haven't touched upon this in the presentation, so thank you for asking me that. Uh, how we do this is um, we build a balanced representation of the patient and organ pair by maximizing a propensity loss on um, the organ itself. Now, the propensity loss is a difficult thing to, to estimate in this setting because the organ is high dimensional and continuous. So what we do is we build um, uh, various clusters of these organs and try to um, maximize the loss on uh, predicting whether or not an organ belongs to this cluster. And if you do this, you build a balanced representation and on this balanced representation, you can then estimate the outcome. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so the next uh, question that we have kind of chronologically in our list is from Christabella, but I couldn't find anyone by that name in the Zoom chat at the moment. Um, Christabella, if you're able to unmute yourself or raise your hand uh, okay. within the next couple of seconds. Oh, hi, brilliant, thank you. Um, and it's for Jaoji, isn't it? Yes, I was wondering the, whether the, the 
the problem statement sounds very similar to a uh, domain something related to domain adaptation where you're adapting to different countries and policies are uh, in meta learning or multitask learning and um, I was wondering if you would place the uh, situate the work in that field and um, since there's two layers and the top layer is kind of shared among countries is what I got. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, very good question. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, I mean, hierarchical model, especially Bayesian hierarchical model, is very commonly used in uh, meta learning and uh, uh, multitask learning. Uh, but I think th this work is more focusing on the multitask uh, uh, aspect because we are we're trying to uh, achieve a good performance on all the tasks involved. But in the meta learning setting, we have some training tasks and. Uh, we mainly care about performance on the on the other set of like prediction tasks. Uh, now we're trying to uh, kind of achieve best performance on, on all the tasks. All right, makes and, sense. Yes, and each task is a country. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Okay. So uh, next up, uh, we have Leila, and um, Leila, I think you actually asked two questions, and I think we can get to both. But if you wouldn't mind, just um, at this point, going at your first question, which I believe uh, we thought would be good for Jeroen, uh, Joanna, and James to answer. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. It was a great presentation. Just briefly, um, in the lambda function for weighting um, for the organ, uh, picking organ matches, um, I know you mentioned three factors. Um, have, did you consider any other factors, like clinical factors as well, to influence the weight? Hey Leila, yeah, so um, with Lambda, we actually weight the ITE and by weighting, you give preference to some patients and, and, and deep preference other patients. Um, in this Lambda, we use uh, the match with respect to survival outcome combined with how rare the organ is. And um, we do this to maximize the total life years of the entire population. However, like you say, you could include other factors as well, but this would obviously have an implication to what you're maximizing in, in essence. So this is possible, but you have to do this with, with some care, I think. I'm not sure if this answers your question. Okay. Yeah, so they're confounding, I guess. Other, you're saying other factors might be confounding. Yeah. Um, okay. The, the, to be fair, the, the, the factors themselves, they are based on clinical metrics. So the, the organ variety yeah, yeah. based on, on, on stuff that that's, that's good. Okay, and I just want to check if Joanna and James want to chime in on this. I'll leave it for about five seconds. And if no one says anything, then I will move on. Um, okay, so our next question is, for, is, is from uh, Haonan and it's for Jonathan, I believe. So please go ahead. Yeah, hi, Jonathan. Uh, I think this is a very interesting presentation. I think my first question is already answered. So basically like this symbolic model is a global interpretability. So is it possible to obtain the feature importance score for individual division? And my second question is like, when we are training this symbolic model to approximate the black box model, uh, do we try to make our approximation to be as perfect as possible? Or like, do you think there is a risk of, of like the overfitting things like we did in, in the prediction task? Yes, thank you very much. So thank you for this question. This is actually an excellent question. Uh, so the first, uh, for the first part, uh, yes, we can produce uh, interpretability scores both locally and globally. Loc the mechanism is quite different because locally we use a Taylor expansion of first, second or third order around the point where you are making a prediction. But globally, we use another mechanism, which is like um, the projection vector that appears in the symbolic model. And that gives you an important score for the a variable globally. And the second question is actually overfitting is that it was actually a challenge when we were implementing uh, symbolic models. So we empirically found that um, like taking mix up of the training data set, the initial training data set is helping a lot in order to prevent uh, overfitting. So yeah, I hope it, will, it answers your question. 
Okay, thank you very much. It's very helpful. Okay, so uh, next up, I think we have a um, question from Dong Xia for uh, Zhao Zhe. Hi, Zhao Zhe. Nice presentation. This is Dong Xia from UCSD. Um, so I'm curious, how did you measure the similarities among the countries? Did you consider the spatial relationship among the countries like the international flight graph? And my second question is uh, about your model. So I'm curious if your model could also provide some lower level forecasting. Because um, we also did some similar uh, COVID-19 forecasting problems. And what we did is uh, state level predictions in the US. And we will do some county level predictions. Because I think the and um, such low level predictions can help local government to better make decisions, uh, especially once we get the vaccines, the vaccine deliveries. I think um, it would be better if we can get some lower level predictions. Um, thank you. Yes, yeah, thanks for the two very, very great questions. Uh, first of all, we measure the similarity be, uh, between the countries by uh, uh, by certain uh, by what we call the uh, country level metadata, which encapsulates the social, economic, and public health indicators that we collected from World Bank. Uh, as to the, for example, the travel uh, international travel, we are using a policy indicator that indicates uh, if there's any restriction on policy uh, on the uh, international travel and uh, what is the quarantine period. Uh, for uh, border clearance, for example. Uh, but using, for example, uh, like uh, the uh, travel graph between different countries is something that uh, sounds very interesting and uh, uh, we would like to explore more in the future. Um, and so as regard to the second question, and uh, yes, this model can also be applied on lower level, uh, like county, uh, county or city level, as long as those data exist. So for now, we're doing it internationally because we can, uh, on the country level, because uh, the international data is almost always uh, in the aggregated form. But uh, yeah, the, the, there, there's no uh, theoretical challenge to apply the model on lower granularity. Thank you. I see, thank you. Okay, so next uh, we have uh, Peter Wojeratny. Uh, I think he has a question for Joanna. Um, please go ahead, Peter. Thanks, Nicholas. Um, yeah, so this is Peter Durani from UCL. Um, and my question's for Joanna about the Saigon model, which I think is really nice work. Um, so they're my favorite questions about how you handle missing data um, and covariates within your counterfactual framework. But I've actually just been skimming your archive paper and I see that the model does handle pretreatment covariates, um, if not explicitly comorbidities. Uh, so perhaps you could just specifically um, focus on answering how the model might handle comorbidities um, and also missing data. Hi, Peter. Uh, thank you for your question. So um, we are not actually handling missing data. So we are making the standard assumptions for causal inference that there are no hidden confounders. Uh, so we assume that in the observation data that we have, on which we train the Saigon model, we assume that in that data we observe all of the patient covariates that can, can affect the treatment assignment and the counterfactual outcomes. So if there are missing, um, missing variables that uh, are affecting like both the treatment assignment and the counterfactuals, then we are not specifically handling that and the model will produce biased estimates. So this is something that needs to be checked before before applying the model on the observational data. And in terms of the comorbidities, uh, they can be considered as part of the patient covariates. So we don't treat them in any special way in the model, but like our model can produce the individualized dose response curves based on the patient individualized covariates. Yeah, that makes sense. Just a quick follow up then. Um, do you think that there's some way that with, with the missing data, I understand that it's, it's standard to uh, to treat it in a in a certain way, basically, in within these counterfactual frameworks. But um, do you think it could be integrated in some informative way, the missingness, um, because it could be informative, presumably, on a given treatment? That is true, and there's definitely like 
I think an interesting direction for future work would be to like understand maybe like infer some late, like if there is missing data to infer some latent variables that can capture the information that may be missing from the data. Um, in the current model, I'm not sure this can be integrated directly, but maybe I will ask James as well since he's also here, if he has any ideas how to handle the missing data. I mean, it would certainly take some further thought because as, as you want to said, like there's potential confounding to be done with the hidden variables, so, sorry, with the missing variables. So like definitely an interesting question, but future work um, currently. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so I think we're down to our final two questions. Um, so we have sort of round two from uh, Leila, and I believe this one is for Joanna. So uh, please go ahead, Leila. Yeah, um, thank you again. Um, one question I had for Joanna's presentation is really good, by the way, but I saw that you work primarily with EHR data. Um, is that in the form of like patient, like um, clinical notes? Did you also consider other um, like unstructured data, like imaging perhaps? Because I'm thinking like as a practical like use case for actually predicting dosage, dosages, clinicians use a lot of unstructured data as well. Um, beyond just the notes. So I'm curious if you considered that. So the way we've developed the model doesn't necessarily depend on the type of data that you give us input. So the model is generally enough and can be applied for different causal inference problems. So we don't, so in our experiments, we do use um, DCGA, which is gene expression data uh, as input observational data. We also have data from MIMIC, which is indeed EHR, but we also have uh, user news data set, which contains text articles. So I would say that the model is not restricted to using EHR data, and in fact, it could be applied to other types of data as well. Oh, that's so interesting. Cool. Glad it's generalizable. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, and final question is um, from Milan, and uh, I think it's directed to Trent. So please go ahead. Hi, uh, hey, it was a great presentation. So I'm Milan Postdoc from, from Ugent. Uh, so my uh, question was for Trent. It was mostly on what Castle actually does with the DAG that you're trying to discover. So does it use this unfaithfulness or this recent approach of um, the no tiers like the, uh, the continuous optimization method for DAGs? And also does it, uh, I was going through the archive paper and I didn't really notice if you only use a local DAG from your uh, the variable you're trying to predict, or your your Y variable, and how it then tries to handle this context dependence. Because I didn't really see how you would do external validity when you only use the data that you have. I don't know if that's super clear, but so there's this recent paper by Moy et al that do, does this context dependence. And I was wondering if you could leverage this in some way to have, add extra uh, efficiency to your model. Hi, hi, hi Milan, thank you. Um, that's a lot of good questions. Um, so first of all, CASEL does, um, does not specifically depend on the assumptions of faithfulness or unconfoundedness. And it is important to note that the goal of CASEL is really prediction rather than the absolute correctness of the discovered causal graph. Um, we designed Castle to be agnostic to the idea of context variables. We designed Castle with the idea of performing under a single context or environment. So um, with that said, there's no reason that our method does not generalize to having additional information such as context variables. However, I would expect this to further improve generalization performance, um, particularly when considering context variables as causal parent, um, which, is, which is what we use um, for our prediction in our neural network. All right, cool. Because, um, so I expect uh, Yeah, because I was then just wondering ahead. what your generalizability uh, assumption is, since you don't use any other uh, context. Is that like the definition of generalizability? Like how do you, because it just seems to be based on this Occam's razor theory that if it's- simple, Yeah, so we're, we're, talking, uh, we're talking about generalization for um, in distribution and single environments, but I think you're, you're referring to um, context, contexts as having domain shift. Yeah, um, yeah, which yeah. I believe is what um, Mo Moji and Magda Keynes work. No, so this this is focusing on on um, generalization as a as a general 
in distribution prediction problem, but when we're talking about out of distribution, you that's when you have introduced the um, context variables. But okay. I, I, it, it would work. It would it would work. Um, it's an isomorphic problem, and it would work fine if you just added the context variables. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. So you. I think. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, I think that's pretty much all we have time for in this session, but just before I let you go, um, so I'd like to tell you about our plans for the upcoming uh, Inspiration Exchange session, which is our fifth session. Um, it will be in late January and our focus will be on synthetic data. I'll provide details about this over the next couple of weeks or so. Um, also, a quick reminder that we are uh, still recruiting PhD students. Uh, we have a handful of fully funded positions starting October 2021. Um, if you'd like to know more about that, please have a look at the URL uh, on the slide here. And in the meantime, of course, uh, Europe is right around the corner. Um, so please do have a look on our website for updates about the papers, the presentations and the events that we'll be doing. Also, if you have any remaining questions on the projects that we've introduced today, uh, please, yeah, you can use that opportunity as well um, during our actual sessions on those papers. Um, in the meantime, if you would like to keep up to date about, your, uh, about Inspiration Exchange, uh, please have a look at our dedicated page for these sessions. But of course, I will also email you and uh, send you Slack updates. And we do appreciate it if you let any friends or colleagues know if they might be interested, please just send them the URL on this slide. In the meantime, um, thank you as always for joining us. Thank you for your questions, your opinions, your observations and contributions. Um, I guess enjoy the rest of 2020. Uh, see you in 2021. Please take care. Stay safe and all the best. Goodbye for now.